Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about some of the consequences of the mean value theorem. So you should already know what the mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem are before you start this. That would just be helpful. And as a reminder, with the way these videos work, you want to pause and try the examples. And I always have free guided notes available to accompany these videos. And if you just want to do me a solid, um, consider liking this video, subscribing to my channel, or commenting with feedback. Um, I'm always looking to improve this channel, and my goal is to provide free quality math instruction to everybody. So if you subscribe or share or anything like that, it just helps kind of get the word out. Okay, so you should already know the mean value theorem. So now I'm going to show you guys um, two corollaries. A corollary just means like a kind of like a, a consequence of, of a theorem. So. The first corollary is this. If f prime of x equals 0 at each point x of an open interval on from a to b, then f of x equals c for all x in a to b where c is a constant. So I would write that down. And then I have a second one for you to write down. If f prime of x equals g prime of x at each x in the interior from a to b, then there exists a constant c such that f of x equals g of x plus c for all x in a to b. Okay, now of course, what the heck do these things mean? <laughs> well, to begin, um, like I said, first pause the video, make sure you have these written down and read them over for a second. And it's always helpful if you can draw a picture to go with this. So going back to this first one, so this says that f prime of x equals zero. So what does that mean about the tangent lines? This means that every tangent line is going to be horizontal, right? So it says this has to be true for each point from a to b. Then f prime of x, or then f of x equals c, where c is a constant. So let's just draw a little picture here. Here's my a and b. And so if my f prime of x is just equal to zero, so this means that if you think about what this looks like, so the derivative is just always this. So this means that you have really something that doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease, right? That's what it means to have a derivative equal to this. So what's the only thing that cannot increase or decrease? Well, it would have to be a constant function, right? So if I just erase this for a moment and draw then what that has to look like, so here I am from a to b, it has to be a function that looks like this. So here would be my actual f of x. This is the only thing that neither increases nor decreases. This would have a um, derivative of 0 all the way across. That's what the first corollary is saying. Now let's think about the second corollary here. So it's saying if f prime of x equals g prime of x at each point x um, in, an, in an interval, then there exists a constant c such that f of x equals g of x plus c for all x in this. Okay, so let's actually just try to think of some derivatives here for a second. So let's pretend that I have my f of x equals to, I don't know, how about 2x? And also then my g of x equals the same thing. Okay, so what this is trying to suggest actually is that we unravel what these derivatives would have to be. So if my f prime of x is equal to 2x, think of one thing that f of x could equal f of x could equal x squared, okay, right? Because if I take the derivative of this, what is the derivative of this? It's 2x, so this would have to be the function. And then what would g of x equal? Well, you might say x squared, but what if it's something different? What could a different function besides x squared look like? Well, it could be x squared plus 7, right? Or x squared plus 72, or x squared plus 725. It totally doesn't matter what this number is, right? No matter what happens when you take the derivative of this, um, this will always end up falling out, right? And so you will still get to the same derivative. And actually, f of x could also have a constant here, right? This could have like a constant of 3 or 31 or 310. It totally doesn't matter what the number here is. The point of this corollary is that these two will have, if they have the same derivative, this is kind of the general stru structure of these functions. So this idea of this general structure of the functions is actually what this part of this lesson is about. And so we're going to play around with this idea of, of like almost unraveling derivatives in some ways. So let's go and take a look at some examples here. Find a function with the following derivative that goes through the given point. Okay, so I've got f prime of x equals 4x, and then I have to find some way to fulfill this condition. 
Okay, so first of all, let's just think of the general structure of something that would end up with a derivative of 4x. You might want to pause the video and play around with this a little bit to see if you can figure this out. So, the general structure of this would be, it'd have to be something like 2x squared. If I took the derivative of this, that would equal 4x, but this cannot be my final answer because I haven't actually taken to, into account this piece of information here. So this will be a big thing. So instead of thinking of it like this, I know this could be plus some number. So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna say this is plus C just to kind of give that a placeholder. And this will allow me then to use this information here so that I can plug that in. So I get f of zero, this is gonna be two times zero squared plus C. I don't know what C is, right? This has to equal five. But now if I write it like that, I can totally see what C has to be. C must equal five. So then the function in question will be f of x equals 2x squared plus five. And you can see, right, if you take the derivative of this, you get back to just 4x, which is what we wanted. So now I have something that fulfills this condition and this condition. So that's kind of the game that we're trying to play here. So why don't you take a moment and try this one um, and try to use all the information and then hit play when you're ready. So why don't you go ahead and try this one and um, try to use all the information and then hit play when you're ready. Okay, so this one is definitely a little bit trickier, right? So you might wanna view this as x to the negative second plus two x, just to help you kind of wrap your mind around this. So the structure of this function then would have to be negative x to the negative one plus x squared plus c. So you're going to have to kind of play this game where w when you're getting used to doing this, where you take the derivative again. So if I take the derivative of this, so remember when I take the derivative, I have to subtract one. So taking the derivative of this first part using the power rule, this would become positive and then I'd have x to the negative second and then this would be plus two x and then that last part would be zero. So I know I've got this right. So um, let me just erase this. Okay, so now I can use this point over here. That's the other piece of information that I have to use. So I know if I plug in negative one, this will be negative, negative one to the negative one plus negative one squared plus C, all of this has to equal one. Okay, so this is gonna be a little bit different. So this gives me negative one over negative one. So that looks kind of silly. So why don't we just rewrite this whole thing then as just one and then negative one squared is one, and then this is plus C, and then all of this equals one. So then if I finish solving for C, I will get that C ultimately equals negative one. So my final answer will be F of X equals negative one over X plus X squared minus one. So I'm running out of room, sorry about that. Okay, so there you go. All right, now there's other ways that this type of problem can present itself. So uh, another way that we can have this is actually with like velocity and position type questions. So here I'm gonna give you the velocity function and the initial position of an object and then I want you to determine the object's position at a time t. So basically I'm asking you to do the same thing as before but now just in the context of position and velocity. So velocity is the derivative of position so obviously the first thing that you're gonna have to do here is um, just kind of unravel this to figure out what your possible s could be. So maybe pause the video and see if you can figure that out. Well, if you're playing along at home here, so this would come out to 4.9 t squared plus 5t plus some number c. So that would be the structure of this. Again, you can double check that if you just take the derivative of this, you will get back to the structure of this. So now I have to use this initial position, or um, this, yeah, this initial position of the object. So I plug in zeros for t's. So I get 4.9 times zero plus five times zero plus c, and all of that equals 10. So that's actually almost simpler to solve in some ways because with all the zeros, everything will drop out, so that's nice. Um, and so then you actually have to just state what is the function. So this will just be 4.9 t squared plus five t plus 10, and so there you go. All right, so one more. Why don't you pause the video and you try this time and hit play when you're ready. Okay, so the initial kind of thought I have for this would be that this has to equal 
negative, so this is going to be the tricky part, right? Negative cosine t plus c. So remember, if you take the derivative of this, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and so that this has to have a negative in front of it to turn this into something positive. So again, it's that, that idea of unraveling. And now I have to plug in zero into this. So I have negative cosine of zero plus c, this will equal one. And what is cosine of zero? Well, cosine of zero is one, so this is actually negative one plus c equals one, therefore c equals two. So my final answer then will be negative cosine of t plus two. Okay, now let's make the question slightly more general. I think we kind of see where this is going at this point. So I can switch up the question and say find all possible functions with the given derivatives. So for instance, with this question here, so just y prime equals cosine of t. Now I want just the most general function you could give me, and this would be y equals sine of x plus c. So this is really all you have to do. Now you don't have to figure out that exact function. You just want to give it in the most general terms. And of course, you can check these by taking the derivative. So don't be surprised if you get a little bit confused with the directions. It's very common when you're trying to unravel derivatives that you start getting a little bit thrown off. So you might want to have a list of derivatives in front of you when you're trying this. So why don't you go ahead and hit pause, try these, and hit play when you're ready. Okay, so these are definitely a little bit trickier. Um, I'll just tell you the answer. So this is two times the square root of x. So the two has to be here because if you think about just taking the square root of x, if I just took the derivative of the square root of x, this equals one half x to the negative one half. And what we have over here, we have no number, right? So what that tells you is that the number actually drops out when you take the derivative. So the only way that number would drop out is if you had a two in front of it. So I'll erase this, that would be the structure of the answer, and then plus c. And now for this other one, so now it's almost like you're, you're kind of like semi-thinking of the chain rule in advance here. This is y equals negative two cosine of x over two plus c. So think about when you unravel this again. If, um, so first of all, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and this is positive, so you know it's got a negative in front of it. Then this x over two, so you can probably figure right that if it has an x over two in the derivative, it has to also have it in the original function. So then you just have to think about what constant do you need to wipe that out. So if I just take the derivative of the cosine of x over two, you kind of get a big hint about this, because this is negative sine x over two, all of that times the derivative of the inside function, which would just be one half. So since there is no number in front here, that tells me that I need something that would actually wipe out this one half. So that has to be this two here, this negative two. So you'll have a whole bunch of those to practice, I'm sure, in any calc book that you desire. Um, but those are kind of the consequences of the mean value theorem. So please consider giving my video a like or a comment or subscribing to my channel. Um, I'll have a lot more content for you guys. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.